Okay. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me here to talk about your or put a little input into your next project of uh, being good to the policy. Um, I must tell you, um, what I did with um, planting uh, nectar rich uh, plants, having wonderful trees around, I think about the trees, but yeah. So, um, every springtime, I wait for the first big honey flow, and I can't wait to see the little trees. The littles are all along Great Road here. There are some on the common. And if you walk underneath them, you smell them. And you cannot help but look up and look at the bees in there. They are very rich in nectar. And the honeybees just fill my their nest up with honey. And I get very good honey from them. So I'm very lucky to have my hives so close to them in trees. But then there are other honey flows. Then the town really seems to be very conscious about planting good stuff. Um, they planted, for example, here in front of the shade block, all these young honey locust trees, um, which is wonderful for the bees. They are honey locusts also by the high school. Um, I check them out every time I walk by there. Are they in bloom or not in bloom? Do I have to pay attention? Um, then they have, uh, they planted actually a red bud tree on my little something uh, on the DPW, uh, please do a red bud tree. Yes, the, one of the first bloomers in town and, and uh, they have these pink, uh, dark pink blossoms and the bees just love them, the pollinators love them. And they are one of the first things which are in bloom. Um, then there's a black locust, let's say, oh, red bud trees. There are a few red bud trees in town. Here behind the town hall, there's a garden which has a red bud tree. And uh, then there's the sourwood. A few years ago, I discovered this huge tree. It looked like a, palm, uh, like a pine tree, but it didn't have needles. So I checked it out and then I saw blossoms from it. So the wispy kinds of tiny blossoms on this little branches flowing down from the big branches. I didn't know what it was. And I had an arborist come to my house to do some on my sugar, cutting on my sugar maple. And I dragged him two blocks down the street <laughs> to tell me, please, what is this? And he didn't know. And then two days later, I got an email from him, it's a sourwood tree. So that is another wonderful addition to the nectar flows of the pollinators, my honeybees. They are fun, <laughs> really. There are about five uh, beekeepers in town, so you Bedfordians really benefit from us beekeepers because, as you know, the bees are in decline, they need to be taken care of, especially good um, because the colony collapse, which is mean, attributed to all kinds of uh, different uh, things. Um, I will get laid a little bit more into, but you probably have also, you know about this by now from uh, Chris Stein. Your, your pollinator. Um, so, and then the town planted crab apple trees on Page Field and also uh, the, um, uh, not the town, the, the um, Rose of Shans, beautiful Brussels Rose of Shans in the Page Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. And if you go by there, you see bees in them, you see bumblebees in them, mm -hmm. you see wasps in them. They're just great. So these are the trees, the main trees um, I have my eye on in the springtime. Then in the fall, I have my eye heavily on the sweet pepper bush around Fawn Lake. All around Fawn Lake, if you go there in the fall, you have the, the you smell it already. It's a very fragrant and it's called sweet pepper bush. And the bees love this. So that is a great place to um, find those pollinators. Then the fields. Bedford has, as you imagine, Bedford has so many fields, 
some of them don't get mowed like the Clark Field uh, of Davis Road to both sides of Davis Road, right? Right. Oh, well, it's it's really worth it going by by right right now. They have probably lots of those golden rods and yeah. lots of pastors. Yes, and then pay, well, the patient community. Then on top of the water tower, there's the field also. And I love going by there. Somebody at one point has uh, started to pollinate the garden. Maybe the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Um, I don't know. But I, last time I went, it sort of got neglected. Or it, maybe the drought last year uh, didn't uh, did do it in. I don't know. And then, of course, my favorite place to go to check my beef is Pagefield. Pagefield, um, the lower part where the uh, baseball fields are, uh, of course, get mowed where the kids run. But the rest of it, I sort of have a special <laughs> connection to the DPW, telling them, please remember not to mow too often. Please don't mow when the clovers are in bloom. <laughs> please leave the, um, uh, the uh, Japanese bamboo, let it grow and just mow it after it bloomed. Um, those are the things which I really, and, and they are, have become pretty good with that. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> but um, uh, that is a wonderful field. Um, and I think, uh, one of my wishes is to convert a phase of page field into a pollinator garden. Mm -hmm. There is this field, it's a field, when you come from the Great Road, there's on the left side uh, the swamp, yeah. the dugout, and it has this mound of dirt which they had dug out. And then to the right side is this field which used to be all purple loose turf. But uh, then, of course, uh, the Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife decided that purple loose fife is um, invasive. And they set out a beetle which fed on the uh, seeds of the purple loose fife. And it just killed us beekeepers because purple loose fife was a wonderful plant to have around lots of nectar, which the bees were using to fill up their, for the winter, to fill up the hive for, for the winter. But so the purple rouge is gone and what took over is all kinds of not very good stuff, you know, just weedy stuff. There is some, there are some asters coming up. There's a little bit more purple loose stuff coming up again. And there's golden rod coming up. Here and there, Blackheart Susan, but basically the field, it would be great to have the field overdone, done over uh, with some direct seed feeding of um, um, something. And uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Vermont um, White Flower Company. Mm -hmm. They are, if you go to their website, it's a great place. Great uh, resource. They have all kinds of different packages. They have a monarch package. They have a, a, a special all-round pollinator package. They have for shade, for mid sun, for full sun. They tell you how to do it, what to pay attention to. And uh, yeah, I, I can highly recommend uh, them. So then the clover planting, I think it's a wonderful idea. They put new sidewalks on Bacon Street in my neighborhood, and they left a strip between sidewalk and street. Apparently the street was too wide, so they narrowed the street a little bit so people couldn't pass easily, so they slowed down the traffic. And they left a strip, um, created a strip of grass and they planted some bushes and so forth. That would be a great place to dig up and put um, uh, clover down. Some of them have clover. There must be a neighbor who was conscious of that. There some have some clover, so it would be nice to to uh, have this every any, anywhere else as well. 
Um, my wishes limit the use of pesticides. Uh, you probably heard from Chris Pine about this, about the near nicotinuids, uh, which it's a very, very common and all around used uh, pesticide often comes together with the fertilizer. Um, and the bees get um, um, consume the nectar from these treated plants and they are getting disoriented. They cannot find home. And it's like smoking a cigarette. You get a little woozy in the early days when we used to do this, right? Um, this is what the bees feel. And um, it is um, in Europe forbidden, uh, but the EPA sort of drags its feet. We beekeepers have tried for the longest time to uh, work with city hall uh, government um, to, to um, do a uh, stop to this. But I still see it in your nurseries. I see it in, in uh, Home Depot big bottles of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I always impress the people I talk to in my in the garden clubs and even the kids in school read labels. It's imidacloprid, it's one of them, and clothiamidine is the other one. And it says on the label and it's, yeah. So limit the, and also <laughs> when I started beekeeping, uh, people were not as um, educated in all keeping things natural. You saw much, much more many lawns, totally manicured lawns. Nowadays, it's really nice to see that many people um, let their lawn grow a little bit more wilder with other things grow in, in it. And my lawn is like this. I mean, from the street, I look, it's green. That's all I want. <laughs> but then in the springtime, I have ajuga growing it. And so we mow around the ajuga until it's done. And people stop in the street and say, this is so lovely. Yeah, it is lovely. Yeah, the bees love the ajuga. And then further, further in the season, there, this is a carpet feed, gill over the ground, ajuga. And then later in the season will be the plantings, you know, with a nice little candy um, um, a candle sticks out. And the bees love to go to these little tiny blossoms of the plantains. And then, of course, the clovers, you know. So um, it, sometimes it really breaks my heart. There was a new building built in our neighborhood, and they put the new lawn in, and everything is just. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then one time I walked by, there was a big patch of clover in the middle of that lawn. I said, yes, you know. And then I walked by a few days later, it was all, <laughs> they had sprayed it. And, you know, so, um, yeah. So, but I think people get more and more uh, educated about that too. And also, not to mow the lawn as frequently. Set your lawn more a little higher and mow it every two weeks, not every week. Uh, that it uses much less water, the roots are much deeper of the grass and um, it's uh, environmentally so much more friendly. Golf courses are just a desert, for example, for bees. They are huge. And for the insects, the pollinators to fly from here to there, where the it, it's just, on a hot day, they can't do it. It's too big of a desert. So, not to speak of the pesticides they use. <laughs> so, uh, weed killers stop the weed killing. Yes. Um, yeah, this is about my five cents worth of my wish to have people use less um, pesticides to let the lawns grow wide, diversely, to peach field, to clover. Great idea. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want me to comment on or to, in, yes. Uh, I'd like to comment on, we were doing a, uh, um,
at the TV video thing at the kids camp at the Wayne House one, yeah. one, one summer. And it was right at the beginning, and the clover was up pretty high, and I was walking from the parking lot to the Joe Blaine Park. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe all the bees. I mean, I kept hearing this fuzzy sound. Yeah. And I looked down, and the clover was there, but there were just thousands and thousands of bees all over the place. I said, gee, I wonder if it's safe here to walk through here. Well, that's why they're more the soccer fields so mm -hmm. the kids when they run. Yeah, I tell yeah. my grandchildren, don't run barefoot through a field of clover. Yeah, I, I, but you know, I walked right through it. They didn't bother yeah. me at all. No. They were all too busy doing what bees do. Yeah. And uh, But they did come. For some reason, they must have got the yeah, idea all the kids are going there. Maybe we better mow it down. Yeah. And I went back the next day and it was mowed down and yeah. not a single bee. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. But these, when they are on a flower, the same as wasps, when yeah. they come to your food, uh, they are not bothered by you as right. long as you don't make any movement. They are too busy to look for food or to e eat the food you uh, have there. Uh, but they are more tricky when you get to the nest. I mean, honeybees, I can have my lunch right next to at next home, and they are gentle and they don't, unless it's for some reason, something spurred them up. I, right. I don't get. But wasps, they are very protective of their nest. And uh, you get stung. Yeah. If you're too close to them, more you'll learn to close over, over one wasp in the ground. Or, yeah, yeah, that is. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that the DPW was uh, very good, or Bedford has been very good with planting. Which I, I'm delighted to hear that because um, I had come across a, um, I don't know what, what it's called, an ordinance or something that um, had come into effect in Somerville where they had passed a law that everything had to have native, any new planting has to be native planting done by the town. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, that would be cool if we could have that happen yeah. in Bedford, but it seems like they're kind of halfway there. I mean, looking at the trees, the new trees they planted, I'm, I'm so pleased. Yeah, I think that the arbor people, I think. So there's, it sounds like there's somebody in the, is it yeah. the DPW that does all this stuff? I think it's with the arbor group. Yeah, it's Denny Freeman is the one that thinks you're the most wonderful person in the world. Oh, you see? <laughs> yes. he he the, so much. Is that the arbor group? Yes, he, he, he does the arbor group, he's the town. He's now, the town field. Uh, yeah, manager. Manager. yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. so th that's, that's good that they're already thinking that way, but it would be good if they kind of made developments that came in that they tell them they would have to do oh, yeah. native stuff too. I don't yeah. know if that's yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, the DP Dabber is, uh, yeah, sometimes last year I was almost to tears though. You know, they have, maybe he didn't get through to some of his workers or something. So there was, I waited for a page view to get into blue with the asters and with the, the golden rods and so forth. And uh, there was a drought last year. So the bees didn't bring any, any nectar because everything was dried up. And then finally it rained and it rained. And now I go to page and check it out. It was all mowed down. Oh, but seriously, I, I just about cried. And then I it just reminded him to to impress his workers, please, you know, not to mow when they see flowers or blossoms, you know. Same with the, um, in that same area is the Japanese bamboo, which is very invasive, mm. I must say. Um, but we are just there. It is between the street and the bicycle path, it cannot go anywhere, yeah. you know? And there are beautiful stands of uh, Japanese, it's also called Japanese knotweed, um, stands of this knotweed. And, um, and it's very important that uh, the knotweed, because again, the bees fill up their uh, storage for, um, with honey for the winter, you know? This is what they, yes. Um, this is going to come out very cryptic because I know very little about this. But a couple of weeks ago, we had a presentation about pollination and growth. Yes. Pollination. Yes. And the club, I think, has a mindset to try to do something. But we don't know what. Yeah. 
And we were kind of hoping that, I mean, we've got, what's the name of those seeds we're going to be giving away? The milkweed. Milkweed yeah. seeds. And then we thought, well, there's a place over where I live on Glenridge Drive that's a conservation area. And then one of our members said, no, you don't want to take those because they got something sprayed on them that's killing people or mm -hmm. killing animals or whatever. Um, and we really don't know what in this community a club like ours can do. We were kind of hoping maybe you could give us some ideas. Yeah. Yeah, one idea is or one yeah. wish to teach people yeah. to convert it into a, a real nice meadow. I would love that. Mm. Because what is right now there, uh, it's it's not very much. It's all kind of weedy, kind of non-blooming, um, uh, how do you call it? Um, early thing. I mean, it, it, not much. Like some goldenrod and some asters, a little bit of loose pipe, purple loose pipe. But, but that is a big project. Yeah, what, what kind of, what would be involved in making that happen and what would be the maintenance required? Uh, maintenance probably nothing once it's going. Okay. But for the, the beginning, you probably would have a backhoe and, and rip it all apart and get rid of um, the top soil with all that. All oh, your basic seeds. Yeah, mm -hmm. before you do the seed and then put some, maybe just the hill where they dug up, put that one on it. It doesn't need to be super soil, you know, mm -hmm. it is wild. You know, the, the uh, seeds that take, you don't need to have special, super fertile, whatever soil. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, when you know, these Vermont wildflower, they are very good in, in, in telling you how to do it. But um, I would just take a backhoe and chop it all up and then uh, put a layer of soil over it to suffocate what's underneath or to, oh, to yeah. um, something and then feed it. I think we could do it. We I think Denny New England Paul. Nursery can help us with yeah. everything. Well, maybe so that, and yeah. also Denny Freeman. Yeah. 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 So I, you, you were saying so it would need to be dug up and reseeded with whatever native, yeah. native uh, plants, and then yeah. um, after that. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> All it needs is the rain and the sun. That that will fulfill the requirements of it doesn't need uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good, <laughs> yeah, that's a you don't need to go vote. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is the time of the year that this should be done? You probably should do it now some already and then see what's coming up in the springtime and then go around and, and rake some more up what's coming up and then you do the seeds. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you would put a layer of, after you dig everything up, okay, uh, you would put a layer of topsoil to suffocate what's left there. Yeah. In my experience, this topsoil would um, uh, encourage, it would feed what's there, not and, suffocate it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, sort of a layer of something which, which suffocates the feed, not topsoil, actually, yeah. Yeah, but again, I would get the advice of this uh, white flower company how to go really about it. I mean, when I established one of those, um, I got a, a package of seed, and it was just so much fun. And I, I cleared off like half of the well, maybe a quarter of the room until here, and I dug up every little bit, you know. It's it, um, uh, but then it has. Over. Like they do on farming, they plow all of that crap under and then they have, <laughs> and they just put seed on it. Basically, that's conservation land. I was totally impressed on how much milkweed was there. Yeah. It was like yeah. oceans off it. Yeah, yeah. Um, with, 
Was that planted or has that did it all come in naturally? I think that came on all naturally. Really? There's a place also on Independence Drive when you go down Colony Circles, uh -huh. there's to the end and there's some swampy area. And then when you take a ride along those swamps, full of milkweed. Yeah, I grew up on that piece of property. Yeah, yeah. And milkweed did go around all the edges. Yeah. I mean, when we were doing hay out in the middle of the field, yeah. it was. Yeah. A lot of milkweed on the side. Yeah. yeah. Boy, it came back fast. It yeah. the whole thing up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about your hives. Yeah. How, how big were where are they and what's the radius and oh what 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 do you do? How much honey do you make? All that. Oh, you stuff. need my detox. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just do, do, do the, the um, one. Yeah, do my hives are on Crescent Avenue, uh, in the center of town. Really, uh -huh. I have four hives. This year I had three hives, and each hive has about 60,000 bees in them. Wow. And so they go for two miles radius. So, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they go, they don't bother you. They're not like wasps that they bother you when you eat, except maybe in the fall when nothing is blooming anymore. Uh, they might come uh, to your juice or so, but really not. Um, um, and um, I make this year. I'm from three hives. I made 120 pounds of honey. Oh my gosh! Yeah, wow. yeah. Like crazy. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's really it's the greatest hobby ever. <laughs> and and then, Vicky, I, I was wondering about shrubs. Are there shrubs that are pollinate the yeah. most pollinator friendly? You can imagine. Rubs? Yeah, yeah, shrubs like uh, oh, uh, forsythia. No, forsythia they don't go to for some but, reason. Yeah, what kind of that? Sort yeah, of thing? yeah, yeah. Good question. Uh, privet hedge. <laughs> they love to go to the privets. And uh, if you have a privet hedge, they have these tiny little flowers. Um, bees love that. Um, Okay. What other shrubs? There's the sweet pepper bush, of course, but you don't grow them really. I tried to plant one in my garden, but it needs really wet stuff. Um, uh, I plant trees. Now, if you have room for a nice tree, mm -hmm. there's the heptacodium, mm -hmm. which is um, it also called the seven suns tree from China. Uh, it looks a little bit like um, hydrangea, but it's tall and the the blossoms are not as dense as the hydrangea. Very pretty, and they, they bloom in the fall. So they are a wonderful uh, nectar source for the pollinists in the fall. Um, How would the Historic District Commission feel about that? Oh, for, for planting a tree like this? Mm -hmm. uh, they would love it. Is it historical? Uh, no. Oh, oh, because from China? Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't, know. oh, I don't know. Uh, well, but that's a good tree to have. The the red pot tree, which is an old fashioned tree, mm -hmm. they are wonderful to have. Say that again. The red bud. Oh, red bud. Yes, yeah. they are great trees to have. Oh. Um, it's so interesting. You said so. I every time you say something that I'm curious about, I, I type it in on my phone. And one of the ones, the heptacodium, there's one at the Mount Auburn Cemetery. Yeah, which is a beautiful arboretum. If you if you've yeah. never been, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, at, you know all the tags oh, and things. A, it's a it's a great place. They were the tours and workshops oh, there all the time. I had, you had mentioned the sweet herbage. Yeah. When I was there, maybe a month or two ago, yeah. I was down by the water. Oh, they I have it there. Yeah. I know. So I know. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Let me think of other. Things. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have suggestions to plant. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think we can. We don't have room for trees, but I'm thinking of specific areas that yeah. like to have shrubs, yeah. like mm -hmm. more flowers. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Any suggestions like that? You know, Paula, we have a pretty good place to put them. If we could clean up maybe the 9/11 uh, memorial a little mm -hmm. bit more, we've got oh. a fairly large area there. 
that so, I'm sure. On the road, do you know where that is? Yes, the Springsburg, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a lovely place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that could be cleaned up again. You could plant a couple of trees in there. Oh. And the bird that the really is. Really yeah, charity, 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 charity. Charity. Yeah. But there's certainly more open space in order to, to do that. Yeah. But you need the right conditions for a tree because mm -hmm. it, it needs is, some sun. Yeah. But we could be sure that there's clover in the where the grass is. Yeah. Don't mow it too often. Yeah. Right. Right. I wonder are there are there like signs? You know, we could look, you know, wouldn't it be cute if little kids made little signs like don't mow, save sure. the bees. Like, I, love I love it. I love it. Yeah, cute little, <laughs> little bees with smiley faces. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a similar experience with my husband once. He thought, you know, he was helping and he mowed the grass. And I was like, well, I was doing stairs and he was, I was just moping around for two days and he said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's for a park has like a lot of clover. And there's a lot of clover. Seeing lots yeah. of bees, you know, when the kids I know, are even now, still, you're like, don't walk up yeah, I know, around by town center in front of this little roundabout, it's full of clover, the bees are still in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you like, if you don't put grass in your yard, the clover will show up. I, I our yard shows that, mm -hmm. just, yeah, it will go anywhere, dahlias. I got dahlias, um, I can die. They are a little bit high in maintenance, but boy, do the bees like those. No, yeah. They are three and four with the bumblebees and the honeybees all together. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to take those out every year and put them back. Yeah. It's very yeah. complicated. Yeah. Way, yeah. way past my pay grade. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I have purchased your honey for the year. Oh, so, thank because you. someone tuned me into having local honey as a way to not have as many allergies. Yes, that's what you need a lot of sun for zinnias. Mm -hmm. wow. My tea and yeah. It's just yeah. yeah, they say it desensitizes you because mm -hmm. honey has tiny amount of pollen incorporated and, you know, and beekeeper's honey is not pasteurized. Oh. It's not super filtered, you know, all we do is strain it. So, um, yeah. And you can, so either, you know, sometimes you've been at the Middlesex Craft Fair, I don't yeah. think they're having that this year. I know. But yeah. you can get local honey at the chicken farm. The chicken farm. farm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they have their own honey there. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. local to Bedford. Yeah. You can get it right out on Route 62, too. Oh, yeah. That yeah. little farm stand. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to eat local honey or to buy local honey. And that also encourages the beekeepers to keep going because beekeeping, uh, uh, 30, I started 35 or 40 years ago uh, with beekeeping. And uh, now I lost my train of thought. Huh? We <laughs> been there. <laughs> local, honey? Uh, local honey yes and so um people think yeah, can i buy your honey yeah mm -hmm. sure you can you know this it's um honey from a beekeeper is the best honey mm -hmm. because when you buy honey uh at stop and shop mm -hmm. who knows where it came from you don't support your locals because your locals support your pollination pollination especially nowadays um, when I became a beekeeper, it was more, much easier to be a beekeeper uh, 40 years ago because there were, all there was was foul brood and maybe another uh, brood disease um, and that we had in, a grip on, you know, with medication. But now, uh, like 30 years ago, the mites, the mite came mm -hmm. up and so bees... And beekeeping has become more complicated, even though it's all worth it. <laughs> it's yeah. really all worth it. But you support, uh, it has become more expensive for the beekeepers because they lose their hives over winter uh, very often. I mean, the survival of the hives is um, not very good. I mean, I lose about two thirds of my hives, you know, every mm. year. Sometimes last year I lost them more. Oh, yeah. So, um, 
So when you lose your whole hive, you bring in a new queen or a new No, queen then queen? I buy a package of bees. Buy it. I thought it's about 10,000 bees in a, in, a, in a little cage with a queen in it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a Miltex County. They send a truck down there. You order three packages of bees and uh, they come. I used to order it in the beginning through the mail, the mail, the post office. Oh, get your bees! <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a question. Um, my grandmother and my husband's grandmother had farms and they used to have a field of zinnias. Now we just thought that they liked to pick flowers and have them in their house. But are zinnias uh, good for pollinators? Yeah, any flowers which have uh, the, the middle open. Uh, yeah. They are good, yes. They go for flowers, they go for the pollen, they go for the nectar. But uh, roses, for example, which are closed, or some of the Rose of Sharon, they have lots of lots of petals and the middle is sort of covered. They yeah. don't like that as much. They like the open uh, Rose of Sharon. Uh, yeah, they like that better. Okay, yeah. and another uh, statement I was going to make, I don't know if people know this, but depending on the flower, the honey has its own flavor. And a friend of mine was a beekeeper in Bilrica for years, very dear friend. Um, she used to farm her bees out, rent her bees out, and would do the cranberry bogs. And that honey was red, and it tasted of cranberry, and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to let people know that different honeys, depending on the source of the, of the flower, have marvelously different flavors, and they should try them all. Yeah, yes. I mean, I. It's 1.30 right now. So. I asked a dumb question. Well, hang on after you ring the bell. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. I'm just going to ring the bell. So, so. Yeah. Okay, my question. <laughs> uh, I hope I don't sound like a stupid guy. What is the difference between pollen and nectar? Oh, oh, please. Oh, good. I'm not alone. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, so, pollen is the male part of the flower. Ah, see that? So, the pollen is on the anthers of the oh, flower, okay. and the male part of the flower, and the nectar is a tiny drop of uh, sugar solution way deep down in the blossom. Ah, so, as the bees go down there, pick up, the pollen gets sort of distributed all over them. Uh, and then they take their little hands and they put it into their pollen basket and bring it home. But they also get this pollen on the other flowers, you know. Um, wind is also a pollinator, but um, um, this is only for the corn, for the pine trees. Yeah. Uh, I think the tomatoes are there. But usually uh, pollen is kind of sticky and needs an insect to transfer the pollen from the male part to the female part. Mm -hmm. um, so the through the air is usually pollen, is that right? Yes, okay. yes, in, from the pine the trees. Inside. From the pine trees. I didn't pay attention to that <laughs> my old <laughs> lesson. <laughs> Do you also harvest the pollen pellets? Uh, I don't, but people do, I don't. Yeah, I don't. But um, Chip and Farm has jars of pollen sometimes. Really? And it's nice on cereal. Yeah, people put it yeah. in. It's uh, very good protein foods, you know. It's, it does that. I, I do nuts. I don't want to take it from the bees. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing is around this time, or a month ago, it started that people call me. Uh, oh, we have a bee's nest here. Can you come and help us? I don't want to kill the bees. I know they're important. So people are very aware yeah. that we have to take care of our bees. Mm -hmm. But then I say, well, you know what? Um, what does it look like? Is it gray and papered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, you know, and then it's a wasp, you know, so we're going to care of the wasp nest. But wasps die with the first force. They live in big colonies, not all of them. They are still solitary wasps too, but the big nests you see hanging in a tree or sometimes in the ground, you go with a lawnmower there and all these wasps come out. <laughs> Those are uh, um, yellow jackets or bartels, hornets, which live in colonies. Uh, they have colonies of you know, multiple thousand strong colonies, maybe sometimes only hundred. In the first frost, though, we'll kill them. But the queen will bury themselves in the ground and they come out in the springtime to build a new nest. 
So in the springtime, when you go around your house where typically a wasp nest and you see they start building a little oh, paper yeah. thing and then more and more and then pretty soon you have three and she lays her eggs in, it's a good time then to take a broom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you know, if the wasps are way out of your way where you don't bother them, just leave them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bees don't live that long either, do they? Honeybees live for well, the queen can live for three or four or five years okay. they yeah. live through the winter theoretically although mine often they die yeah. because <laughs> of the disease they have now but but you know they live this is why they collect honey make honey that is their winter food right. but bumblebees no no the regular bee you know the european imported bee yeah the, the honey bees. bees don't live that long do they the honeybees yeah the wasp live i mean the the queen bee lives a long time, but the actual worker bees. Oh, they, they all live. Well, well, the actual worker bee only lives for a few weeks. Yeah. But she, the queen, lays every day 2,000 eggs. <laughs> so yeah. she makes new bees all the time, and hopefully she goes through the winter with a strong colony. Because what happens in the winter time, the bees gather around the queen, and the bees on the outside fan their wings, yeah, keep, it warm. keep it warm, and eat honey for the energy they need. But bumblebees also die with the first frost. So, and the queen, again, there too, they bury themselves in the ground. And in the springtime, they come out and find a new nest in the ground, in the ground someplace. That's only two weeks ago, work a bee. Yeah, it's a little bit longer. But yeah, they work themselves to death. They yeah. fly so many times back and forth to flowers that they, they yeah, yeah. About two weeks, three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Different yeah. <laughs> questions. Do you dress up, you know, with everything, or you don't? I I dress with jeans and a long sleeve shirt, and I have a veil. I do have a veil because I don't want the bees to get caught in my hair and then I go like this and the neighbors say, what is she doing? <laughs> so, you don't need a veil, okay. So, but, you know, on a nice sunny day, you don't really need to dress up either, but I do, mm -hmm. you know, because I regret it maybe. <laughs> yeah. Not to have dressed up. Cool. Well, Great. thank you very much thank for you. for being such a nice audience. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I hope I could contribute a little oh, bit. Yeah. Well, <laughs> a new project.